there is strong biological um, reasons why people struggle with their weight, many reasons outside of their control. And so I would just tell you, um, keep an open mind about all of these things. But I can tell you a lot of my patients carry a tremendous amount of baggage from uh, the way that they have been treated throughout their lives for their weight and their real condition that other providers have spoken down to them, have blown them off, have uh, sort of misappropriated other appointments as a sort of weight counseling session. All of this has impacted the way we as humans, quite literally, view weight and we talk about it, how we think about it. And much of that um, dialogue is around this idea that, well, if we only would work harder, we would be healthier. And the reality is our environment has a much bigger impact than our own willpower. Um, we are much, very much a, uh, a product of our environment. And some of that environment we can direct and some of that environment we can't. And so I would say there are many things that are uh, working against us that are very real that we have to work with. Um, and that's not even including the way that our own biology is working and how that is working against us oftentimes. And so this concept that it's people's fault because they struggle with their weight, I mean, it's silly. I mean, even, and I see it all the time. People in the comment section saying, oh, it's it's not my, you know, it's my fault because I just eat. Yeah, and I would I would push back in many ways. Why do you eat? What's the reason you eat? I know you eat to live. What are what are the, what are those reasons? And almost always, there are very good reasons why the person does what they do. Sometimes it's because it's a coping mechanism. Sometimes it's because they have a biological issue that's driving them to eat. Sometimes it's because they never had the right education on how to care for themselves. It's very rarely, you know what, Doctor Albert. The reason I'm eating Big Macs every day is, you know what, I chose to because I love Big Macs. I chose to be this way, to feel this way, because it it was a goal of mine in life to 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 get to this weight and to live at that weight and with all the you know health risks that go along. That was my choice. I've never seen that, frankly. And there are almost always deeper reasons for why people struggle with their weight. And so um, I I hope that in educating people about the disease that they live with for many people, that they can feel liberated, that it's not their fault. And I think that's part of the healing process. So we got to break these shackles that, that are weighing people down. It's really tough. Um, why is it so difficult and more difficult in many ways than breaking a, a addiction to substance use? Well, one, you have to eat to live. You don't have to drink alcohol to live. You don't. And so therein lies the challenge of food addiction. You have to eat to live. So that means you have to find ways to eat without eating those foods that are triggering. And that is the challenge because those foods that are triggering, it's one thing to avoid alcohol because you're avoiding liquor stores or whatever. It's another thing to avoid food when a lot of the problematic foods, these are refined sugar, refined fat, ultra processed foods, those are the addictive foods, muffins, donuts, cheeseburgers, pizza, all of those foods. They have a combination of sugar, fat, salt. Um, they're everywhere on every street corner in every restaurant. That's that's a real challenge. That's going to continue to be a, a major challenge of the 21st century. Is how do we help people that have now developed a food addiction? Medication can help. It's not the ultimate answer. Um, behavioral treatment can help. Um, but even then it has some limitations. Um, I think you have to work with a specialist who I think it's helpful for many people to work with a support group to have people, um, that they can learn from, talk to, who have gone through similar experiences, but it's not easy. Um, because it's really hard to turn that switch off when once again, the environment makes it so easy to consume and you have to eat at the end of the day. It's not like other substance, other addictions where you can, you don't have to do it to survive. You have to eat to survive. So it, that, that, and therein lies the problem, like I said, um, not easy. And it's not a, it's not a small problem. It's not something I can respond to very quickly. It's, it's a very big issue that uh, is very personal. Working out is more important for your health 
less important for losing weight. But what we know is that even the best studies looking at exercise as an intervention for weight loss, weight loss is about one anywhere from one to four pounds over the long term. So exercise alone is not an effective treatment. It only leads to a very small amount of weight loss um, by itself. Now, if you pair that with sufficient dietary changes, then you can have a additive effect from the exercise. And oftentimes exercise is self-reinforcing. But um, exercise is not sufficient for weight loss, not meaningful weight loss. Um, so, you know, if you're not putting in that, if you're not making the necessary changes to your diet, then exercise is not going to do much. And you certainly aren't going to outrun a bad diet. That That is a truism that um, we see time and time again. Portion control works for some people. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, I think it really comes down to the quality of foods because if you're eating the right quality of foods, those foods will help you stay satisfied, will help reduce your hunger so you're not eating as much throughout the day. What we know is the evidence, the best evidence we have, high protein amounts, high fiber, which is mostly found in plants. The combination of those two things in their unprocessed form, so we're not talking about plants that come in packages that are you know, processed like granola bars, not like that. We're talking about like the actual plants that you get, fresh produce and high protein meals, that the combination of those things at, at a very low calorie amount produce the greatest uh, suppre natural suppression of hunger and uh, natural improvement in satisfaction with food. So what people end up doing is they end up eating those foods, they spontaneously stop eating throughout the day. And so throughout the day they consume less. So the studies we've done looking at those two variables uh, have been effective, very effective. So um, whether you're looking at um, high fiber diets like whole food plant-based, whether you're looking at sort of high protein diets like a Mediterranean or even a lower carb paleo type style diet, they all share those similar characteristics. They emphasize healthy lean proteins, they emphasize plants. They do so at different amounts, like the plant diet's more heavily focused on fiber. The, some of those other diets are more focused around protein, but they all operate based on those same principles. Um, we really want to get, get away from the added sugar, the added fat in your food, which you can find on nutrition labels. We want to get away from the refined carbohydrates, um, the saturated fat-based foods. You know, We don't want to be putting in because they have a lot of energy and they're not great for your cardiovascular health. So... Focusing on protein and plants um, really is a foundational piece, I think, to, um, to any successful weight loss program. It's tough. It's tough as you get older. As you, as you age, your metabolism slows. Um, it becomes increasingly more important to do things like strength training to preserve your metabolism. Um... um by definition, by definition, because it's has to do with the thermodynamics of energy flow and and energy transfer. If you are not losing weight, then you are by definition not in a calorie deficit. So I would just, for whatever that's worth, there are a number of factors that may be contributing to why you're not in a uh, calorie deficit. But by definition, you cannot be in a calorie deficit if you are not losing weight. I mean, the reality is doctors can prescribe any medication for any reason. So I don't know if you guys know how that works. We can prescribe any medication for any reason. Once you get a medical license, as long as the drug is not a controlled substance, which requires a special license called a DEA, you can prescribe it for any reason. So you can, it doesn't have to be FDA approved. You just have to be obviously willing to defend the reason you prescribed it in a court of law. So oftentimes doctors will prescribe things for FDA approved reasons. But many times we don't like probably half the medications I prescribe are for off label use for weight loss. Um, and so I think, you know, we try to always leverage all the uh, intended and unintended effects of medicine to our advantage. And that's really where the understanding the side effects, the risk versus benefit ratio in that case. No one's just prescribing these on the street corner. These are prescribed by licensed professionals who understand the side effects, who talk to their patients about those side effects and who have discussions about the risk versus benefits with those patients, ultimately, it should be a shared decision, right? It should be, okay, 
patient understands all the concerns and consideration, doctor understands. After both of us understanding and having open dialogue, is that something we still wanna to pursue together? If we're concerned that there might be side effects that cause unintended harm, or is there a way for us to monitor so that we can keep track and make sure that that doesn't lead to really serious complication? If your doctor's not doing all these things, then they're not practicing medicine and they're not doing their job. They should all be doing these things. I certainly do it with my patients. I follow them frequently. We monitor if there are any concerns. So it's not like people make it out like the things I say translate to you guys like just walking out and going to Walgreens and getting mad. They don't, obviously. And I know most of you guys understand that. But for some people, you know, it takes a few times until they until it hits home. Weight loss medications are prescribed over the long term. Um, there are some that are FDA approved for short term use, like fentermine. Um, but ideally they're pre prescribed long-term. Um, and if I, I use this analogy and I think this will be a good, uh, sort of stopping point. If you think about what it took for you to lose weight, if, if you've ever lost weight as an individual, maybe you're someone who has lost a considerable amount of weight and are currently maintaining it. You've had to make changes that are permanent to some degree, right? Well, either dietary, some other lifestyle changes. Maybe you gave up alcohol, maybe you stopped drinking soda, Maybe you stopped eating junk food, stop, cut down on your fast food, something, right? And as you can imagine, if you were to stop doing what you're currently doing to maintain your weight, the moment you stop doing that, your weight's going to come back on, right? If you start drinking again, you started eating, you know, Pop-Tarts or whatever it is, the weight's going to come back, similar to when we use medications. Well, if you stop a, an intervention that is successful in keeping you down at a reduced body weight, the moment you stop the weight's gonna come back. It may not come back completely 100%, but it also may, and I can't promise that. And when we look at the research around that, anytime a patient stops whatever intervention they're doing that's helping them lose weight, the weight's gonna come back. So you have to keep that in mind anytime that you pursue uh, an intervention, whether it's a liquid diet, whether it's a fasting protocol, any of these things that are often sold to people as, as effective means to lose weight. It should be always considered with the long term. If it's not going to be considered with the long term, okay, that's fine. What's the next step? So sometimes I have a, uh, a medical weight loss protocol that I do with some patients who are higher risk where we try to do some really intensive weight loss early on. And then we have a plan that's well thought out that allows them to phase back into a different way of doing things. Um, but the new, the new way of doing things is different than they used to. So you always have to have an understanding if you're going to stop any intervention, how, what's the next step? If you, if you stop it and go back to the way things were, your weight's going to come back. So that, that has to be, that's critical in your understanding of weight. The way that the physiology of weight management works is your biology never takes a day off. The moment you stop whatever intervention it is, your biology takes back over and you gain the weight back. So you have to understand that. It has to be permanent. It has to be long-term. You, you can love your body at any weight. We can also acknowledge based on the science that being at having excessive weight can be cause real health problems. Those concepts are not mutually exclusive. They should absolutely both be discussed. So your weight does not determine your self-worth, which is where a lot of the haas came from. Um, but at the same time, we can acknowledge the health risks like we, like we would for any other disease. If, if we're not willing to acknowledge the health risk, we're just pushing more bias on people, right? If we, if we think it's not a big deal in terms of its health implications, then we are turning a blind eye to what we know has serious implications on someone's long-term health. So it's not, that, that's not, I'm not pushing an agenda. That's just what the evidence shows. So once again, we can have both of those conversations. Um, we can talk about how we value people, how we value each other as a society and and how we how we continue to love and respect people for their differences that should happen we can also acknowledge the health concerns related to to having excessive unhealthy weight